Okay, so this ship should probably have been part of the key ship series. It really should have been. But it's also an integral ship to the development of naval aviation. Even though most of you will have probably never heard of it. And I do not expect this video to do well in terms of its YouTube ratings. Because, let's be honest, as the logarithms go... Ben Maishiri... That's not really a name which is going to stick out. But, they're going to be missing a gem. So, to those of you who do watch this video, I hope you're going to enjoy it. And I hope you're going to find it interesting. Because, this is, this is a special ship. This really is an absolutely special ship. And, because it's such a special ship, I am, once again, re-recording just before it's supposed to go live. So, I am once again being a... There are phrases for what I'm being. I will let you avoid hearing those phrases, but I am. I am being an absolute... So why is this ship so important? It's a seaplane carrier. Well, it's at several important war operations. It's the first carrier of any kind, kind to really launch a successful anti-shipping strike, even though that's a story in and of itself. It's the first carrier to be sunk by enemy action. And it's destroyed by land-based artillery. Which might explain why Royal Navy carriers from then on have a penchant for shooting at land-based artillery. I mean, HMS Unicorn from the Korean War, of course, the not an aircraft carrier, HMS Unicorn. Forward Aviation Support Ship, sorry, I made that mistake again. And template for the light fleet carriers, but not, an, not a carrier itself. Um... Famously, in, in, in during Korea, decided that frankly, aircraft were for um, amateurs. It had four-inch guns. It did, could do the job itself. But pretty much, yeah, she's the first lost, and the way she's lost means that the Royal Navy gets to do a lot of studies of her, and they find a lot of studies about her, and they're looking at her going, "Hang on, the reason you had a fire which we couldn't control was aviation fuel." Wow, this aviation fuel burns like anything. And I'm actually going to end up saying something nice about Admiral Chatfield in this video. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be it's going to be a video for the ages. I'm going to be saying something nice about the man who, for political reasons, and his obsession with proving Admiral Beatty correct, who was his who he he was the flag captain for at Jutland meant that, you know, he committed the Royal Navy to having 14-inch guns for their King George V. There are so many things I find wrong with this man, and yet in this video, I am going to say good things about him. I can't believe it either. But please, please, just hang along for it, and hopefully you'll enjoy, because it's... Ben My Shree is a bit of a wild ride. She really is. And Travels, Battles, and Daring's. Yes, it's the shameless book plug. I do this in every video. Why? Well, I'm a contract lecturer for those who don't know. I go to universities and I go and teach. And then I leave. Uh, basically, it's short. It's, the, it's otherwise known as short-term teaching posts. In the UK, we sort of reformed our tenure system in about 1988. If you don't have a permanent contract, you do not have tenure. So, PhD students, anyone who's on a short-term contract, etc., doesn't have tenure. And even the versions of tenure in the UK is interesting. So, well, how do we compete? How do you compete for a post in the UK university? Is it your ability to teach? I would love to say it was, but let's be honest, most universities are more after the research funding, which is a far bigger proportion of their income. And they get research funding by having higher-profile academics. Which means academics are hired, broadly speaking, on their ability to produce journal articles, which uh, which create newspaper and newspaper articles, or their ability to do books, which get widely procured by people and therefore reach bestseller lists or anything like that. I haven't achieved that yet, but um, I live in hope. I live in hope. And what I have achieved, though, is all thanks to all of you. What I have achieved is all thanks to you. By the way, anyone who's thinking I look a little bit mucky today, I'd like to point out I'm not mucky. I have not been rolling in dirt. I'm wearing a corgi t-shirt, no fluffs given. And um, the poodle, when he saw this, decided to jump up 
on me with money paws and put money paws all over my shoulders. So basically, I have got a fluffy research, a senior fluffy research assistant, aka poodle signed, corgi shirt. It happens. It's dogs. They're lovely. They really are. But that's life. Anyway, there is a competition going for this book. Uh, I like it. It's the story of the tribal's battles and daring class destroyers and how the Royal Navy turns destroyers from being a torpedo attack craft into being a general purpose weapon of war, which also does the presence mission, steps up in a cruiser role, and really is the basis for the modern destroyer. And it's through these three classes through World War II, tribal's battles and darings. And it tells the story. And currently, it's the prize. Two of these are up for prize for a competition that we're currently running. Well, I'm currently running on this channel. Why did I say we're? Who's the we? Well, I suppose I'm including the fluffy research assistants as I was just talking about them, but honestly, they're doing none of the admin work. I've got the ship shape crew doing the judging and Glenn Stewart. Um, but no, no. The fluffy research assistants are merely looking good. What can I say? They do that very well. But yes, this is the woman of my heart. Ben My Shri. And that's what it actually translates as. Now, she is a very interesting ship. She really is, even before she becomes a seaplane carrier, even before she has her conversion. Now, if you're a Manx person, i.e. you're from the Isle of Man, you'll probably know that she was the third of six of these vessels to bear this name. You'll also know the name specifically is supposed to be Ben Micre. Ben Micre. Not Ben Micre. Now, why do I mispronounce it? Because of my father and because of specifically what his best friend at the time worked on. Because, you see, my dad and his best friend were involved both in the working in the building of the 1965 version of Ben Micre or Ben Micre. And his friend went on in his course of spending his time in Alaman and it was always insistent on name being correct. My father, born and raised in Liverpool, loved to wind him up by calling her Ben My Shri. So I went through the first 20 odd years of my life believing that was how you pronounced it and pronouncing it that way because no one corrected me and my father had basically drummed in that was how it's said. Okay? I get older, I'm at university, I'm having this conversation with the then lovely Dr. Michael, M Michael Partridge, who unfortunately no longer is with us, and he corrects me, and is the first person to correct me. But I'd spent 20 years of my life calling her Ben My Shri by that point, pretty much. So, please note, I know it's Ben My Cray. I do know that's how you're supposed to pronounce it, but please bear with me, because... In a way, I'm keeping the joke alive, because I would normally go back and sort of not do this, but my dad's friend is still with us, and it's something that he we still wind him up over. So, for those of you, before you do a big comment this video going, you're pronouncing it wrong the whole way through, please note that this I'm doing this because of a friendship which lasted between two men for, a, well, my dad was in his 80s when he's died, his friends alive for roughly 70 years, and it's his friend still does watch my channel. I doubt he'll comment. If he does, he might well back up the story, in which case that'd be lovely. But if he doesn't, I don't really mind, because I understand if you're that age, you don't want to comment on YouTube videos. Uh, my mum is sort of considering coming on the YouTube channel, but is, um, yeah, leaving it to one side. And so... That is, before we get into this too far, I just want to explain that. So if I call her Ben Mashri, the whole way through from now on, please note, I do know what how to, what name is supposed to be saying. I do know how to properly pronounce it, but I'm continuing the tradition. Okay? So that's it. So, Ben Mashri, or Ben Macre. I'm going to call her, I'll try and keep her Ben Macre in, the, in this part, because it's a talking about the actual... Um, Actual, actual ferry. There is the other fact that when she was in the Navy service, again, there was that was where Ben Mashri came from, because some of the sailors did call it that one, and they transfer it, and that's where my dad picked it up from because of that tradition. So, 
there is a sort of cadence and a sort of logic to doing that. But, now she was an interesting vessel, and this is actually from the Daily Mail, published Saturday 11th of July, 1908. And it's worthwhile reading, reading because it's a really cool write-up. It's from the days when even papers like the Daily Mail didn't just have a specialist naval or naval warfare correspondent, but also had merchant marine correspondents. And one of the things you have to realize is that as time has gone on and the way and the finances, especially in media, have changed, a lot of the specialist positions have disappeared. Which is annoying, but it does mean you tend to have to go hunting more for specialist magazines to find the level of knowledge behind the writing. Rather than what someone's managed to get in like 24 hours notice or 5 hours notice from their editor to write this many words. It's the realities. It's not bad people, it's the situation. But this is what's written in 1908 by such an informed correspondent. And she was being touted by this point as the fastest and most luxuriously appointed channel steamer afloat. A mini Cunada was the idea they were putting forward. And, well, here is what was written up about her. What the Lusitania is to Atlantic, the Isle of Man steam packet company's new steamer, Ben Macre, will probably be to the Irish Sea. There can, of course, be no comparison as to size between the Leviathan Cunardas and the speedy little Manx boats. But for years, there has been a quiet, determined contest between the vessels of the two companies for seagoing speed honours. The diminutive boats plying from Liverpool to Douglas claim pride of place until the advent of the Lusitania and Mauritania. Infected by the competitive spirit, directors of the Isle of Man Steam Packet Company resolved that their next vessel should not be far behind the race. The Ben Maikre, it is asserted, can reach over 25 knots, and it is expected to re reduce the t record time, 2 hours and 56 minutes, from Liverpool to Douglas, at present held by the turbine steamer Viking, by 6 minutes at least. Apart from the contest for speed honours, there are many points of similarity between the Manx vessels and the new Cun uh, Cunard liners. Now, the Viking had been built three years earlier. And it was employed on the uh, Steam Packet Company's Douglas to Fleetwood schedule. They wanted something bigger for the Douglas to Liverpool schedule. And that was the Ben Micre. And she is an absolutely gorgeous looking ship. If you can see some pictures of her, she really is. I would argue she's probably the best looking of all the ships that have served in the role. Although the 1875 and 1845 models do give do give a bit of a run for the money. To my mind, the 1927 one is a bit blocky looking. Uh, the 1965 one does look like it comes from 1965. And the current vessel, which I think comes from 1998... Uh, but I think she's repla was replaced last year. I'm not 100% sure. She's a row row, a row packs vessel. And um, so, yeah, she looks like a row packs very. She just looks like it. Um, is she? I'm not sure if she's still in service. Uh, I know she was replaced by a Manxman in 2023. Um, I'm not sure if she is still. If the Ben Macre, the current one, is still around, or if she's going off to different waters, or if she's going to be decommissioned. Uh, I think she might still be in service, but uh, I think she was at least replaced on her main route by Manxman. And who knows? Not something I keep up her. Massive deal on her. If I visit, when, if and when I next visit the Isle of Man, then I will have a look at the Manx Ferries. And I might do a whole video about the Manx Ferries. It would be quite an interesting thing to do. The Isle of Man Steam Packet Company is a really interesting organisation. And kind of like we have a history of saying the French are the Royal Navy's uh, overseas reserve force. Uh, the Isle of Man Steam Packet Company have been known to be the Royal Navy re needs some really, really fast ships. Fast. So, a company. I, they're about the right size. 
they are often the right speed, and they're often the right capability for a range of tasks which the Royal Navy might decide they need something for. In which case, they're going to phone up the Steam Packer Company and go, Can we have this? And the Steam Packer Company usually goes, oh, We'd prefer not to, but how much are you willing to pay? At which point, it becomes about price. And how much can the Royal Navy get out of the Treasury? Often depends on the situation. So let's consider the changes that the, the ship goes through. As a passenger steamer, it's 2,650 gross registered tons. Gross registered tons. Now, that equates to the volume of space within the hull and enclosed space above the deck of a merchant ship, which is available for cargo, stores, fuel, passenger, and crews. So basically, gross range tonnage is actually a measurement of capacity rather than displacement. Whereas displacement, well, that tells you how much she displaces. And that's what the Royal Navy is going with. So their one is 3,888 long tons or 3,950 tons. Length as a passenger steamer was roughly 120 meters, 390 foot. As a seaplane carrier, 387 foot or 118 meters. Now, how does the ship shrink in length? Well, I'm glad you ask. It's because the Royal Navy plays around with some of the things like the stern, etc. And it's amazing how things can lose length when they, uh, when they do so. The beam stays the same. The beam stays the same. It's 46 foot, 14 meters. The draft, well, again, you'll notice that the steam line, steamer has this phrase of depth. The Royal Navy has the phrase of draft. Depth is preferable how the how shallow a, a shallow, shallow piece of water it should be going in it shouldn't be going in anything less than 18 foot six inches deep however the royal navy don't care about that they care about draft okay this is four point this is 16 foot 4.9 meters so if it's if it's five meters deep that's enough space for us to get through it'll squeak but we'll do it it'll squeak like my chair which I'm probably going to oil eventually, but at the moment the squeak's useful for me. It accentuates some things. Dex 5 stays, broadly speaking, the same. Now, here's where things get interesting, because the power in the passenger steamer is three sets of Parsons, single reduction gear turbines working at 170 pounds per square inch, or 1,002 kPa, in turn developing a 14,000 shaft horsepower. For a top speed of 24.2 knots officially, unofficially reputed to obtain 26.9 knots. Well, that's fairly respectable. But in the Royal Navy, how she's got officially 14,500 shaft horsepower, and her top speed is listed as 24.5 knots. What happened? Well, the Royal Navy did a bit of tinkering, a bit of checking in the engines. You know, just when you're you, you, when you, when you are taking a ship into service, you play around a little bit with its engine, and it's it's good to know that a little bit of tuning can get you an extra 500 shaft horsepower from it, extra 500, and can get you a whole extra 0.3 of a knot. Although, again, with the Royal Navy, there is some very interesting accounts of her performance, especially with the Harwich Force where she was known for doing some very high-speed operations, including one of which, which, if you include the fact that they were zigzagging a bit at one point, and as well as doing a straight run, and the speeds the other ships seemed to have been going, I would say she must have been sustaining 26 knots, at least, and could well have been achieving higher than that at certain points. A lot higher than that. I'm talking 27 points, 27 and a half knots. Now, why am I saying this? Because of the way she's maneuvering with the Harwich Force, because of the way they're maneuvering. And again, one of the joys of naval history is that you have the speed a ship's supposed to go in peacetime under peacetime conditions. In wartime, when you've got a threat of submarines or enemy strike or you're trying to do a mission, you can find all sorts of interesting ways to probably bend, break, or generally refute the laws of physics by 
absolutely caning the engine as hard as you can to do sorts of, all sorts of naughty things. That is the point that often has to be understood around about naval ships and the speeds they're given, and official speeds, etc. And it's kind of like the, the safe firing doctrine of when you're firing your guns. Uh, there was a big discussion a few years ago over the Royal Navy's 12-inch guns uh, turrets, and especially some of their other battleship turrets, but mainly 12-inch turrets, over or not they could fire over each other. And the 13.5-inch turrets, whether they could fire over each other, because they have sights which don't react well, and the peacetime rules for firing include do not fire over the lower turret. Okay? Don't do it. But in wartime, they did. But in practices, they didn't. What's the difference? Well, in one scenario, you can get killed. So you take the risk. If you do do damage to the turret, or even if you do accidentally hurt your crew, you prefer not to. But you're far more willing to take that risk under a firefight condition than you are under a scenario where it's peacetime drills. It's just, there's a difference in the equation there. There's a difference in the level of risk you're prepared to accept to carry this task out, the level of damage to the ship you're prepared to accept. And it's the same with ships and the speed. Because most of the speed limits, when you see them on ships, and we'll get, we give these figures, now, with some navies and some nations, what you are getting is a hard and fast rule. This is the absolute maximum the ship can do. But often that's the maximum the ship can do because we're worried about the hull splitting apart, not the maximum the engines could do if we were really, really pushing them. And if we're not so worried about the hull splitting apart because we can ends justify the means, we can probably push them a little bit faster. Good example of the hour class. Because of some of their shaping, etc., and some of their design, honestly, that was a factor in their consideration of their speeds. But I wouldn't be surprised the hours can go a lot faster. I have heard accounts where it's been strongly suggested they've went a lot faster than their official top speed. It's in the right waters, and it's in a scenario where it's important you go faster, so you're prepared to take the fact that you might end up fixing that bow and doing a lot of damage to your battleship. It's important for strategic reasons that you take that risk. So again, I would not be surprised by a ship which in peacetime has attained potentially 26.9 knots on a trip between Liverpool and Douglas. I would not be surprised about that. Then in wartime, equating to a ship which has already been tuned up by the Royal Navy, achieving a sustained speed of 26 knots. I just wouldn't be surprised by it, despite its official speed being 24.5 knots, according to all the stats we work for it. So, that's my point. Crew, 250 in a naval configuration, 116 in civilian configuration, but the capacity was 2,700 passengers as a ferry, or a passenger steamer. As a seaplane carrier, well, she's got four 12-pounders, always use one of those, two 3-pounder anti-aircraft guns, and between four and six seaplanes. That's a fairly good load. And it's making full use of her. That is making full use of her and her capabilities. It's a good, good transition. And it's a very useful ship to transition. There is a reason why, as I said before, uh, the Steam Packet Company, the Manx, shipping, uh, Man Manx Ferries, are a favoured port of call for the Royal Navy when they need smaller, fast ships. It's something they go to. And this is what she looks like when she's commissioned into the Royal Navy. This is Ben Maishri. She is looking proud. Let's be honest. She still retains her lines. There is, though, something of the Tiger Class conversions going on here. Uh, the post helicopter when the Tiger Class cruisers were converted into helicopter carriers. Uh, helicopter cruisers, I mean. A sort of forerunner of what would become the Invincible Class. And you sort of, you see to see this sort of we've got these lines 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 and then I'll back it box. But strange enough, I would say it works far better on this ship, far far better on this ship and her lines than it does on Tie Class. 
I really would say it does. Now, the Royal Navy actually got a very big steal with this because she was an expensive ship to operate. So, whilst she is launched in 1908, whilst she is launched in 1908 and completed by August 1908, for the cost of £112,000, and it's the status symbol for the Isle of Man Steam Packing Company, um, she burns nearly 100 tonnes of coal a day. Someone has done a natural study and said it comes in at exactly 97 tons of coal a day. But there are others which say it was slightly more, depending on the routing. So I'm going to go for roughly 100 tons of coal a day. And the... Well, the Steam Packet Company did try and save money by not necessarily buying the finest Welsh coal. Uh, they bought good quality coal, but they didn't buy the finest coal. Certainly not the level of coal which the Royal Navy is prepared to buy for its warships. Which could well have been another factor in the speed increase uh, and the operation of Ben, May uh, ben Maishri. Because, well, she's a good ship. Give her good coal and a crew who are prepared to push her and have an incentive to push her, which is more than just winning a race, but actually life or death. Maybe not for them, but for friends. And, well, she's got the options. Her conversion is carried out by Camelevs. She'd been built by Vickers at Baron Furness. So she's got two of the finest yards in Britain behind her, in terms of construction. She's a, she's a good quality ship. And what they've done is literally, as you can see here, uh, replace part of her aft superstructure with a hangar. Um, they'd also added in uh, derricks fore and aft that were strengthened to the point at which they could lift her. I think the derricks did come from her ferry days, especially if we go back to the early picture. You can see them, or at least see the mast they're working from. But... They do seem to have been modified and strengthened. There was also a dismountable 60 foot, that's 80 meter long, flying off platform installed forward of her superstructure. It was equipped with trolley and rails to allow the seaplanes to take off. So she's a very advanced little ship. And again, there is part of me sitting here going... Oh, she would have been useful to have had at the Battle of Jutland. Because, my, my, this ship might have actually been able to keep up. And with a forward launching platform, well, she could have launched the aircraft. She'd have only had to stop to recover them, not launch them. It's an interesting idea, but she, of course, is off doing other things. And sadly, she's lost in January 1917. So... Her war service, she's commissioned in March 1915 and sunk in January 1917, is, let's be honest, and we are being, strictly speaking, honest here, 21 months. You can argue over days. She racks up an extra eight days in March and an extra 11 days in January. So, okay, we can go for 21 months and 19 days if you want to be absolutely precise. But let's be honest, that's not exactly the longest war service. But by gum, does she rack up some great, uh, great feats in that time? And that, again, to me, shows just how interesting a vessel this is and just how useful a vessel she is. Now, after she's come into service, who does she go off to serve with? Who is this ship, this fast, beautiful ship, going to serve with? And please note also, she's her weapons, she's serious about them. She carries 130 rounds per 12-pounder and 128 rounds for the three pounders uh, in may 1916 she gets a 12 pounder aa gun and another three pounder aa gun and some two pounder pom-poms um all on army carriages are also added and she carries even more rounds for them as well so she has guns well the first service and the first group she gets assigned to is the harwich force 
Yes, she's going to Harwich. She is under the command of Commander Cecil Lestrain Malone. And she takes part in the attempted air raid on Nordic. Uh, that was design, designed for the 3rd of May, 1915, but that was abandoned due to thick fog. On the 6th of May, she went on another mission to try and attack Nordic, and during this point, she actually accidentally rams HMS Lennox in the thick fog. The damage is slight, and the destroyer stays afloat, but, you know, it's still annoying. They made a third attempt on the 11th of May, but again, abandoned due to heavy fog. And it was at this start raid, during this raid, that Ben Maishri attempted to launch her Sopwith Schneider from the trolley on the foredeck. Unfortunately, the engine backfired, uh, wrecking its starter and breaking the pilot's wrist as the starter handle was in the cockpit. That is the Sopwith Schneider, which is a, another... Love little aircraft. Uh, I really should have a decent picture of it. Let me find one. Now, it was called the Sopwith Schneider because it was designed for the Schneider Trophy in 1914. And this is the actual the trophy entrant. And honestly, the actual military aircraft is not much different. Um, the a variant of this is the Sopwith Baby, which goes on to become one of the first decent fighter aircraft. But it is a... Really, really interesting little aircraft, mainly because its propensity to try and kill its own pilot. It has so many different systems in there, which I swear were designed with the idea of trying to damage, maim, or kill the pilot. It really does need to be flown by someone who is a very passionate, very committed, very experienced and professional pilot. Um, as you just heard an example for, from the uh, raid on the 11th of May, well, you know, did break its pilot's wrist <laughs> with the starter handle. <laughs> That's before it even gets the engine going or airborne. Break the pilot's wrist, go on. Might as well. So after these unsuccessful attempts at using her, and honestly, the Harch Force had really liked her, and it's one of those things, again, if those attempts had been successful, would she have stayed? I don't know. She's considered rather useful. And she's probably the best available to self-support herself. So, she, along with our HMS Ark Royal, are sent out to the Dardanelles. In fact, she sails for them in May 1915, carrying just two short Type 184 torpedo bombers. Just two aircraft on this trip. And um, arrives in Lesbos on the 10th of June. And her aircraft and her were a very welcome arrival. They really were in the Dardanelles. Now, I'm going to cover the torpedo strikes in the next slide. So please note, I'm not going to skip those out. But those and the other work of the short 184 or type 184s I'm going to do their own slide on so I'm not skipping but I'm going to cover the Dardanelles and then I'm going to go back to them because otherwise I'd have to have a picture of the Dardanelles, a side of the Dardanelles then the 184 then the Dardanelles again and that just seems to me to be adding too many slides and too much complication into what should make sense and follow quite nicely anyway so why does she have her aircraft out there? Well, she's out there for spotting, for naval gunfire support, for troops ashore, to conduct reconnaissance, and to generally keep an eye on what's going on in the wider area. This is very important when you consider there are things called the Goban and the Breslau. Now, I will add that those by this point have re been renamed, or are on their process to being renamed, and we of course know from history how often they actually do manage to come out, but that doesn't matter. At this point, they were a threat, they were a risk, and so they preferred to know if they were coming or not. Mainly if they were coming, there was a plan for a certain battleship which was in the area to go um, shippo on shippo with them. Uh, preferably, probably backed up by the Lord Nelsons, but it was felt that HMS Queen Elizabeth would probably be able to manage to them. I'm fairly sure myself that's the reason why they didn't come out, was because... 
You're looking through the Dardanelles and you're going, so I'm going to go straight through, not be able to turn around. I have to go straight through, out and turn around once I get there. The whole way through, I'm probably going to be running the risk of running into that, which is sitting grinning somewhere over there. Grinning, going, Hello. I've got 15-inch guns. And I'm quite fast. Not as fast as you, but quite fast. It works. It does work as a deterrent. So, what does Ben Marshery get up to up here, out here? Well, she's doing all sorts of little operations. Her aircraft are constantly flying. She's maintaining a constant patrol of aircraft in a way which the Royal Navy is going to really start to depend on in the future. They start to get really used to the idea of constant information. One of the things that's interesting in some of the post-war discussions and summaries about the role of naval aviation, especially in a certain committee I'm going to be discussing right at the end of this video, is that they're going, well, hang on. How was it we were achieving this level of information flow out here, but we weren't achieving it back here with the Grand Fleet? And there's a whole discussion of the realities of the system, but basically it comes down to you need a ship which can, in this scenario, they had the communications, they had the capabilities all wrapped up in Ben Man 3. But, but, the thing was, no one was moving around enough for her to get disjointed from the rest of the fleet. And this is another reason why full flight deck carriers and, you know, full deck. Fly, a full flight deck, you know, a full length flight deck carriers become a big part of the Royal Navy. And one of the reasons why they start designing the carriers that they do, and because they design them in a way to always be around the flagship and the flagship to be within communication rate, hopefully, of the carrier, that's one of the reasons why they then don't have necessarily the facilities on some of the carrier designs that we would expect that you see in the American ones. And then it's as things go on, they go realize, oh, our carriers are going to all be a flagships. It's not just going to be arc roll. It's not just going to be courageous and glorious. It's going to be oh, oh, we better have space. That you start seeing the expansion of the British island until you've got to the modern structures, where honestly the things we expect our island structures to do on our carriers are so massive and so inclusive that we have two islands now. There you go. All that traces back to Ben Maikre or Ben Maishri. See, I'm going to keep it up to... Uh, to uh, I'm British. We never drop a wind-up if we can. So, on the 2nd of September 1915, she was actually used to rescue Australian troops from torpedoed troop ship HMT Southland of Lemnos. Um, the ship was then, after that, she's transferred to Port Side after the end of the Gallipoli campaign. But she's pretty much wandering around being an important ship. The whole way through the Dardanelles campaign, she is being a present ship. And actually, what's really interesting is that in January 1916, she is recognized and is created as the flagship of these Indies and Egypt uh, seaplane squadron. She's pretty much been already doing that role during the Dardanelles because she has the facilities, she has the space, she has the crew, she has the capabilities of the personnel aboard. And so now we get into this. Well, pretty much you're going to be talking about the 12th and the 17th of August and the 11th of August. Because on the 11th of August, 1915, they spot a Turkish ship off the north coast of the Sea of Marmot. On the 12th of August, they go to Torpedo. They don't realise at that point that the ship has already been immobilized by the E-14. So, on the 12th, they return. They attack. Charles Edmonds actually leaves his observer behind and flew with a reduced fuel load to lighten his aircraft, enough to carry the 14-inch torpedo, the 810-pound, that's 370 kilogram torpedo. He drops his aerial torpedo. It's a distance of... Roughly 800 yards, rough, well, that's roughly 730 meters, but it's very rough estimates. At an altitude of 15 foot, or 4.6 meters. I, a uh, lower altitude than the draft of the Ben Maikri. And 
sadly enough, turned out, well, that the ship had already been hit by the E-14 and was already beached because of that. However, on the 17th of August, they find another ship to attack. And this time, he launches another successful attack and manages to hit that. However, here's where something really interesting happens. And yeah, Edmonds has managed to sink a 5,000 ton ship properly on the 17th of August. It's, it's a very successful attack, but it's not the most fun attack. No, no, no. That's done by Flight Lieutenant George Dacre, who accompanies Ed Edmonds as his, own, uh, as his wingman, um, suffers engine troubles, has to land in the Dardanelles. While he's taxiing on the water and trying to fix things, he spots a steam tugboat, which he torpedoes while taxiing. And there is an actual discussion about this in the reports as to whether or not he spent some time chasing the aforementioned tugboat so he could line up the torpedo. So there is a very sincere option that there was a British naval officer, flying officer, in his short 184, like this, taxiing along the water, chasing down a tugboat going, What the friggin' is after me? What is that? No one told me there'd be that! <laughs> anyway, he sinks the tugboat. And then he has to taxi for uh, several miles again. And manages to get airborne and was within gliding distance of Ben Maishri, uh when his engine fell permanently. So he managed to glide down, land and be, be rescued. Or rather, recovered and the aircraft fixed. Isn't that a heartwarming story? You have engine troubles and you end up taxiing after a tugboat to sink it. I just feel sorry for the poor tugboat captain who's just going, what the friggin' is after me? What am, I, what am I supposed to do in this situation? Ram it? Cry at it? Shout at it? Anyway, as said, after all this, she goes off to become the flagship of the East Indies and Egypt Seaplane Squadron in January 1916 and spends 1916 doing all sorts of little jobs everywhere. But before I get into her loss and her career even after this point, I want to quickly cover this gentleman. And I'm going to first start by probably out, uh, butchering his name, and I do apologize for that. Mustafa Ertugul Aka. Now, he is an officer often forgotten in most Western sources in history of this period. But he is one fine artillery officer. He has a battery of 75mm or 77mm, depending on some sources. I think they're 75mm. I can only find from the sources of production 75mm, but there's at least two books I've got which list the guns being used as 77mm. And so I'm really not sure. But they don't list any of really other details. But I know they're mountain guns, and the type of mountain gun I'm producer of them, produced the 75mm mountain guns. So, um, air hard gun mountain guns, they do seem to be 75mm, broadly speaking. He says, broadly speaking. The other option, of course, is that they might be in a crop gun, in which they would have been 77mm, 7.7cm uh, guns, but they specifically say in most of the sources they the air hard version. So, I'm not sure on this one. This is one of those things where the sources really aren't helping. The more sources I have, the more different variations I seem to have. And so, it's great. This is one of the points of being a historian is, I'd really like to go and get to the bottom of this, but I doubt I will have time. But I will try someday. I really will. And anyway, what happens is, he manages to get his guns into position. He has four of them. And he manages to fire at the Ben Maishari and sink it. He also fires at several supply and ammunition ships and even a French patrol vessel called Paris. Now again, there are some interesting things because that often gets confused with the French battleship at the time, which was also called Paris. There was a Corbeil class around which is called Paris. 
But there is a patrol ship called Paris Number 2, which is going around. And I was even myself, whenever I've seen the name, when I first saw it, went, oh, was it a merchant vessel called Paris? Because there have been lots of those. There's even one, if you ever go down to Kovrak in Cornwall, Kovrak, you will find a the Paris Hotel. The reason it's called the Paris Hotel is because a vessel called the Paris found it on the rocks and managed to basically scupper itself nearby, and so the hotel is named for the ship which wrecked. So, yeah, Paris is a, one of those names which wanders around quite a bit. But yes, it's a it's a it's a French definitely a French military vessel, and it seems to be a patrol vessel, small schooner like vessel, which was being used to support amphibious operations. And he also sinks her. He he has a, a good old time with those guns, and he is a really good artillery officer. And should be thought about a little bit more than he is. Anyway, so how did Ben Maishari find herself there? Well, this is a bit of an interesting bit of history. She is, first off, after she's had been made the flagship, she is wandering around supporting the general officer commanding Egypt. Uh, primary role being to, with her and the LC plane carriers, to provide overwatch on Turkish positions and movements in some Palestine and Sinai, and keep moving around to do that. She collided with the SS Uganda on the 11th of February. This badly damaged her bow. And so on the 13th of March, she goes into Suez to be repaired. This takes until 12th, 20th of April. So she's out of duty for that period. At this point, then, she starts going through a few changes. And in May, and May, uh, May 19... 15, uh, 1916, she has a new captain, Commander Charles Sampson, replaces Lestrange, as Mal uh, Lestrange Lamone, Malone, and a Lieutenant William Benn joins. Now, William Benn is an interesting career. He goes on to become the Secretary of State for Air. He goes on to becoming uh, doing all sorts of duties as both a minister and as a member of the House of Lords. He was Secretary of State for the Air from 1945 to uh, 3rd of August 1945 to uh, 4th of October 1946. He'd been Secretary of State for India between June 1929 and August 1931. He's a Labour, um, um, an eminent Labour politician. He's the father of Tony Benn, who goes on to become an even more eminent in his own way Labour politician, and the grandfather of Hilary Benn, who was also quite a famous British politician. Um, he's currently still serving, I think, in the Shadow Cabinet. Um, I forget what his post is, but, you know. They are an successive family. Now, he bases a lot of his experience on his time as an observer, including some of his time with the Royal Navy Flying Corps. Um, he was... There is a discussion as to whether or not he actually gets to Gallipoli on time. He, he does claim... There are various things which claim he was in Gallipoli, but um, he wasn't seconded to the Royal Navy Air Service until 17th of May 1917. Um, now, he was in the Royal Flying Corps, and he did work with them, and they there were a few of them out in Gallipoli as well, but... A, Again, it gets an interest. It's an interesting thing as to what exactly he's doing out and when he's doing it. And there are people who are far more specialist, politi uh, specialist historians who track that sort of thing than me. So I will leave that to them. All I will say is that he gets a DFC in September 1918, and the citation is pretty darn good, which suggests to me he did a lot of work. A gun observer of exceptional ability. After setting out on a bombing raid, the scout machines assigned to act as an escort became separated. Scouts were what well, fighters were told at the time. And it became necessary, then became necessary for the bombing planes to proceed on their task without support. Captain Ben's machine took the lead, followed by three other bombers, and succeeded in dropping his bombs, direct hits, on an enemy aerodrome. On the return journey, the bombing machines were attacked by several enemy scouts, which were eventually driven away. Recently, this officer organized and carried out a special flight by night over the enemy lines under most difficult circumstances with conspicuous success. He has at all times set a splendid example of courage. Now, a splendid example of courage is usually code in these sort of write-ups for, oh my lord, this guy is absolutely... He has no, shows no fear. Great leadership. Splendid example of courage. 
those are things for we have we have nothing but praise for this man we're also not sure how he's still alive he does good he does good now doing all this in december 1916 She's helping the French troop, the French, when they're trying to occupy the Greek island of Castelrosso. Uh, their plan is to occupy it and use an advanced base against the Turks, the Ottoman. Uh, well, pretty much it's the Ottomans, but pretty much by this point it is the Turks. It's the Ottoman Empire is already collapsing, and it is pretty much the Turks running it and taking it over. The Ottomans managed to get an artillery battery of four 155 mm guns and 12 probably 75 millimeter guns within range of the island. I think the discussion might be over the fact that some list them as three inch guns and some people turn and turn 70 uh, well presume that's going to be 76 point something or 77 or it could be 75. Let's be honest they all left them get called three inch guns. The French commander while doing this requested that a seaplane carrier come to assist with reconnaissance in the area. Now she'd already been nearby, but she's now moved up to the actual island, uh, to the actual sort of area of operations, because she's the fastest and quick and most able to respond. So Ben Maishiri arrives. She gets into position on the island for January 1917, anchors in the harbour, which faces uh, faces the mainland, and two hours later, the Turkey uh, the guns open fire. The Ottoman guns open fire. They hit her with their third shot. They hit her with their third shot. And this is a problem. Because the subsequent shells managed to disable steering. And, most importantly, start a fire in the hangar, which spreads across their upper deck and quickly consumes the ship. The crews are ordered, ordered to abandon the ship after about 40 minutes of bombardment. And... They only have one remaining operable motor lifeboat of the three that have been stowed aboard, mainly due to the fire. It's the fire which is doing most of the damage, not the artillery. One officer, four ratings were injured, but no one was killed. They, the Turk, the Ottomans continued their bombardment for roughly... I've got Turk slash Ottomans on my notes, and I'm going to keep with Ottomans because it's, they are pretty much the Ottomans, but... For reasons, I have Turks there, because later on a lot of these forces become part of the Turkish forces, so... Sometimes in a slightly different lecture, I use these notes for different things. The Ottomans continue their bombardment for roughly five hours. She starts to list to starboard, and sinks in shallow water. Later on, the captain and chief engineer manage to return to her to rescue the ship's mascots. A cat and a dog. And they had both managed to survive the attack. And... There was a whole sorts of things over who was going to go back, and the captain and chief engineer insisted it be them. They didn't want to risk anyone else. They didn't accept volunteers. They didn't say, oh yes, our lives are more precious. No, they went. The captain and the chief engineer. Her position remained until 1920, when it's, uh, when it's refloated and salvaged. And then she's beached. Now, at this point, she's beached on the 4th of September, but she's not towed to Venice to be, to be demolished till 1923. What's important to remember is, though, that probably from the moment she's attacked to the moment she's actually demolished, the Royal Navy and other navies, but mainly the Royal Navy, keep sending people aboard her to do carrier inspections and try and learn from her fate. And this has a big impact on the Royal Navy. The legacy of her loss is one of aviation fuel can start a fire. And that's a problem. And that's a very big problem. She was a useful ship and they lost her. She was a ship they would have preferred very much not to have lost. And they lost her because of aviation fuel. Yes, the artillery started it. Yes, you could argue positioning her in a island's port, main port, facing the mainland where the artillery can line up on her was silly, if not absurd. 
you could argue that officers who'd been had actual experience of Gallipoli, uh, a, a fair number of them had, should have probably learned and remembered the lessons of Gallipoli that the Ottomans were very good at artillery and gone, no, we shouldn't do this. But they didn't. They positioned themselves where they were ordered to, they were setting up where they were ordered to. And that's a problem. That is a problem. Because... The Royal Navy has to learn from this. And they do. They The very easy thing would be to brush it off and just go, well, we'd never be so stupid as to get in that position again. We'd never be so stupid as to make that mistake again. And uh, so now we don't need to learn anything else. But they don't. They stop, but they go further than that. Because they go, well, hang on, even if we have done that, why did the fire spread so quickly? We weren't taking that much damage. This is a very hardy ship. Why couldn't we... We, we should have been able to get it up and moving. Why do we lose control so quickly? And it's quickly worked out to be the methodology of the aviation fuel. Now, I have a couple of paragraphs here from my PhD thesis. I'm going to do... As time goes on, as we get more into the 1920s carriers, I'm going to do more about the development of the fuel management system. So, I mean, lots of people are recently going, oh, we want videos about this. We'd like, when are you, are you going to do a video, video about this? Are you going to do a video about it? Yes, it's planned. There are videos for it. And thank you for showing interest in it. But I believe it or not, I'm not doing a specific video around fuel management systems because, honestly, it's not that complicated. It's not complicated enough to, uh, to fill more than probably a 10-minute video at maximum. Whereas if I weave it into the wider story of fire mains and other developments which are going on with aircraft developments, it actually makes A, a lot more sense because it fits in with them, and B, it's a lot more interesting and it's a longer video. And it's all about how the carriers develop in the 1920s and 30s. But these are two paragraphs from my PhD thesis. And what's most interesting is they come from, largely in these paragraphs' case, the minutes of a very special committee. The uh, Joint Technical Subcommittee on Aeronautical Requirements of Ships. Believe it or not, this is a committee which runs through quite a large chunk of the 1920s. And it's just part of the Royal Navy and various other committees that are going on. Even when the Royal Navy doesn't have control of the fleet air arm. The Royal Navy has committees like this. And you find people like Henderson turning up to them and giving evidence. And basically, these are the paragraphs from my thesis. When aircraft carriers first evolved, fuel was moved around in tin cans, eventually even in drums. Fueling aircraft was an incredibly labor-intensive process, and an incredibly dangerous one. Any slip, any spark, any accident, accident could result in a major fire and potentially a lost ship. The iron were not slow in looking into a better system, however, they had experimentally fitted a small 100-gallon tank operating on the bywater system, which was used by the Air and Admiralty Insurer Establishment in Furious. Now, that was a, de a deployed system which would allow you to fill up from a tank system. That you'd have you'd have tank to turn around and, yeah, we can manage it. We've got this tank. We can move it around and then fill up from the tank. So we can use a hose from this tank. We can move around. And they attempted HMS Furious, and the system could not be regarded as free from disadvantages, mainly because the tanks kept rolling around. And was judged inferior in several respects to the German system found on the Stuttgart which is one of the ST playing carriers, which I'll be doing a video about at some point this month. Not in all respects, though. As in the bywater system fitted, there was to be a steam pump with a hand pump auxiliary for if it should fail, and fuel would drain back into storage upon the system not being used in order for it to be safe. That was useful. That was part of the British bywater system as it was adapted for ships. And it was found that the Germans had a central system, which didn't have the drain back. The British had a, had a mobile system, which did have the drain back, and they liked the drain back. These advantages were incorporated with the benefits of the German system to provide the first generation of system, which could be, could, would be advanced with each new carrier. The advantages in capacity and weight of central fuel distribution were, of course, very important, the latter being more important post-Washington Treaty than pre. 
but it wasn't the driving factor behind the transition. The driving force was a need for greater safety and security. A hangar deck is a dangerous place, and anything which makes accidents less likely can only benefit operations, and therefore overall capability. It's safer because instead of drums lying around with the potentially explosive combination of fuel, fumes, and confined space, while ordnance is being handled or aircraft are worked up upon, uh, there is a risk of situations happening which said drums would intensify. Furthermore, there is the fact that whilst hoses come with their own risks, they are intrinsically safer, more flexible, and less manpower intensive for the fueling of the aircraft, thanks to their relative weight in comparison with drums, especially when they're empty. Even more useful, it is u it used basically the same principle as DRN applied for the movement of shells and cordite, which was something that the rest of the Navy was intimately understanding and supporting of. Yes, the Royal Navy really did love that. However, support technology was not limited to just what directly connected with maintenance of aircraft, but also to that which connected to operations, and it goes on from there. Now, here I did promise at the beginning I was going to say something nice about Chatfield, and I will say something nice about Chatfield. And it comes in more, in, even more into the legacy of the loss of Ben Maishri. There is one serious area of absolute agreement between Chatfield and Henderson, and it is fuel management. And it is how we make sure to minimize fire loss to ships. The Royal Navy spends an inordinate amount of time, both when it comes to motorboats, when it comes to aircraft, when it comes to anything to that will involve fuel being outside armored spaces, making sure it gets back to armored spaces as quickly as possible and stays there and is preferably not able to be easily reached from the outside. Now, whilst there are still instances in World War II where there are fuel fires, and you will still have fires aboard ships to this day, because fuel, especially some of the fuel which is used for military operations, naval operations, is extremely ignitable. I could say flammable, but I want to get used the way a phrase ignitable. It is extremely ignitable. It is designed to be such. It is designed to be a very powerful, very strong fuel, which allows you to get the maximum out of your aircraft engines. Remember the comment I made already about the high quality, highest quality Welsh coal and the difference that could bring to the operations of Ben Mashery versus the good quality, but not the most expensive stuff that the Steam Packet Company procured. There's a difference even between Welsh uh, gradients of Welsh coal. People always go, well, it's Welsh coal, it's got to be great. Well, it's going to be Welsh coal, but there's Welsh coal and Welsh coal. It's like there's good when it comes to steak and good. There's a difference. It's the same with, the, uh, military, with all sorts of fuels. The fuel the, uh, the forces tend to require has to be good. It has to be good. Very good. And so, that can lead to its own problems. Now, one of the things you find that comes out of BT, all the stuff BT does post Jutland, etc., is he tries to make a case, especially focusing in on the shell storage, despite the fact he'd encouraged it and the various handling the magazines, but also flammableness on British ships. And a lot is tried to be based on uh, aimed at, you know, oh no, it's because their ships were so flammable, it's, we've got to manage this. So, one of the things when Chatfield becomes first seal, or at least absolutely obsessed with, is making the ships as inflammable as possible and making these systems as manageable as possible. Which Henderson really likes, and is one of the reasons why Henderson, using the example and the information gained from studying the loss of Ben Mashery, is able to really push forward a fuel management system, which I would argue. Is probably the best in the world in World War Two. I would argue that all the fuel management systems which are developed aren't too bad. Um, some navies are a lot more clunkier than others, and some navies are a lot more confident in their own survivability than others. But I would argue that of all of them, the British is probably the best. It is the fastest at charging. It is fastest at draining the fuel back to safe, in, uh, safe areas, and it is the most reliable by a country mile. Now, the problem for the British 
is that the system you have that's developed by World War II is probably what we call the Mark X. There are vessels wandering around like HMS Eagle, which have what is probably the Mark V. The British have put so much money into developing it that they have a succession of developments. And those developments actually start earlier than the interwar years. Pretty much almost the moment she is lost, they start working on systems. They'd already been working on them towards HMS Furious. They start working on other systems. And working on it, and working on it, and working on it. And when they get hold of German seaplane carriers, the first thing they're doing is ripping them apart to study their fuel management systems. There are examples in of letters and notes which I've had translated and given to me, been shown to me by friends who do them, of French and American officers talking about British officers approach these ships and going, they're obsessed with this stuff. Why? No, we should be looking at the aircraft handling characteristics, their operating characteristics. The British engineers, they're just obsessed with their fuel management systems. Why? What is this? Why are the British so obsessed with this? And it's, it is literally the fire damage. It's literally the loss of Ben Mashri and the legacy it leaves, but also the general British post Jutland, post a lot of experiences in Model 1, fear of fire. Because, as I've said in this video, uh, I, well, as I was saying in this video, and as I've said in many, many other videos, because I think I've cut the bit where I said it in the earlier in the video, there are two ways to sink a ship. You make a hole, which lets in a lot of water, or you start a fire, which the crew can't control. And one, one of those systems requires the crew to have brought the material that's going to cause them to not be able to control it with them. So if you are a Navy, you can't you can do your best to mitigate and try and prevent a hole which you can't control the inflow of water from appearing and its movement of water throughout your ship. You can do the best to do that. But you really can work hard to prevent there being a fire which your crew cannot control on the ship. The two ways are making sure flammable materials are as secure as possible and making sure you have enough fire mains, that's water pumps basically, and water supply of water on the ship, to be able to put the fire out. But the other interesting thing you have that carry uh, that of course the factor of course is fire mains on a ship tend to fight fire you fight fire with salt water and so you have to think about that in your design of your carrier in your design of your spaces okay we're gonna have a lot of salt water go through here it's going to do damage to things it's going to stop the fire it's going to do damage to things how are we going to have the systems aboard ship to be able to fix that and again this is a legacy of that thinking from 1920s and 30s that when HMS Illustrious does suffer a fire when there are fires in our hangar. The aircraft are managed to be restored and reactivated. And the air, this includes the engines are cleaned out. They are bathed. They are cleaned out. The, end, the salt water that's got into them through fighting the fire is fixed. And yes, you there are these, these things have to come through. Okay, well, the aircraft were a constructive write off due to the fire. Yes, but the engine wasn't. And lots of other spare parts that they took from the aircraft weren't, and they were repaired aboard ship because of the legacy of this work. So, with that all said, and realizing that it is now 7 o'clock, and the video is supposed to go live at 7, so it's not going to go live at 1900 hours tonight. It'll be slightly later. I do apologize. But I hope you enjoyed this. It's, it's grown by about... It, the original version was about 40 45 minutes long and this version's going to be a bit longer that's the tad i've also added in about three slides so i always finish these videos with a question and i'm not going to change now i actually put up a very good question for ben mashiri ben mashiri of course has that forward launching system and whilst i consider the legacy of losing her to be a massive gift to the Royal Navy and its development of aviation and naval aviation and aircraft carriers are leading up to World War II. There is the part of me which goes, well, hang on, what happens if she'd been kept back for the Grand Fleet? Now, there's Engadine, there's other vessels with the Grand Fleet. There are. But the thing is, they have one vessel with the Grand Fleet and they have one with the, uh, one with the battlecruiser fleet, that's Engadine. If they'd, ha it would have made sense to have had a second with the Grand Fleet, which would have meant 
that they would have had a vessel, or they would have probably not left both behind. Let's be honest. Uh, the fact that their seaplane carrier gets left behind, races to try and catch them up, and then gets sent home because she's not being able to be escorted and is causing uh, is is causing Jellico more stress than she's worth at that point. In Jellico's opinion, is a whole other question. But if he'd had a second one with him, the odds of both ships missing the signal and not going out with them is kind of unlikely. In fact, the odds are that if one gets a signal and the other one doesn't, that there's probably a message from one to the other going, why aren't you getting your steam up? And that might even cause them not to be lost. And also would mean there's a ready-made position for that carrier to slot, uh, slot in with the Grand Fleet because it would slot in with the other, uh, other seaplane carrier. But she, Ben Maishri is an interesting one, because if she was there, she has, of course, her launching system. Do you think she would have had an impact on the ground fleet if she'd been available? Because I think I don't think HMS Ark Royal would have, as becomes HMS Pegasus. Yes, she's the first purpose-built seaplane carrier. Yes, she has all sorts of systems, and yes, she's very interesting, but I don't think she would have had that impact. I think this vessel could have done, because also I think this vessel could have kept up. With her speed advantage, at the minimum she's got a free knot advantage over Dreadnoughts. At the maximum, she could have a five knot advantage over them at their full speed, let alone their cruising speed. Their cruising speed is probably 12... It's usually 12 to 14 knots. Sometimes they're doing a bit faster, but usually it's 12 to 14 knots, so she could easily have caught up with them. If she'd been catching up with them, or could easily operate with them, go off and drop, uh, launch aircraft and recover them and get back. And well, she wouldn't have to go off to launch aircraft. She'd only have to go off to recover them. That's a huge advantage. I'd be really interested in seeing what you thought. And of course, we have been talking about them. Well, it's 824 Squadron next week, but then it's the conception, operation, and conclusion of the Kaiserlick Marines carriers, uh, their seaplane carriers, on the 26th of March. And I hope you enjoy that one. And yeah. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. And thank you again for everyone for all your support. It really does mean a lot. And thank you for liking, sharing, subscribing, all those things, and patrons who make their suggestions. The patron suggestions should be out for May. Should be going live. Well, they would have normally gone live on Sunday. They didn't go live on Sunday because there wasn't a live, so they've been slightly delayed, but they're going to go live. This Sunday, this Sunday, or probably this Thursday, actually. I'm, I'll give you give you a few more days to put in suggestions. So they go like there'll be suggestions will be fine Thursday till the following Sunday, and then the vote will be from next uh, the following Sunday. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care and have you had a good time. Hope you enjoyed it. Ba -da -da -do 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 -do.